So good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to talk about some really exciting stuff today. We're going to talk about how you can keep your SharePoint and OneDrive data safe. I know all of you are itching to know that, and that's the first thing you want to know this morning, so thank you so much. So just to set some context, uh, you might have seen these numbers yesterday in Jeff's talk. We have over 200,000 organizations that store their content in SharePoint and OneDrive. And we are seeing amazing growth, almost exponential growth, both in the number of customers and in the amount of data they're bringing to our service. You trust us with your data, and we take this responsibility very seriously. We're trying hard every day to make sure that our service is giving you industry-leading security and compliance to make sure that you feel comfortable bringing your most valuable data and putting it in our service. When we think about security and compliance in SharePoint and OneDrive, we have a few guiding principles. Our first principle is, it is your data. You own it, you control it, we adjust the caretakers. You have full control over the data, who has access to it, who is doing what, and frankly, in case you ever decide to leave our service, you can take your data with you. It always belongs to you. Our second guiding principle is that we must give you a platform that has industry-leading security and compliance built into it. A platform that can quickly adapt to your changing needs and new compliance standards so you don't have to worry about it. Third principle that we take very seriously, we've talked about this before, we strongly believe there is no security without usability. You have to let your users be productive. Security cannot get in their way. If security gets in the way of users being productive, they will find some other way, probably a less secure way that you don't like, to get their job done. So you, we need to make sure that we are giving you the controls to, so you can adapt the security in SharePoint and OneDrive to meet the needs of your organization while letting your users be productive. When we think of security, we think of five key areas of focus. Our first area of focus is platform security. This is all about the processes and the infrastructure in our data center to keep your data safe at rest the way it's stored in our data centers. Secure access and sharing is all about giving you the controls so you can make sure that sharing and access within your organization meets your security needs. Awareness and insights is all about giving you complete visibility into how SharePoint and OneDrive is used in your organization so you can make informed decisions. You can get more value out of your Office 365 subscription. Information governance is about giving you control so you can govern the life cycle of the data in your organization. You can decide when to delete it. You can create policies for how long to retain it. You can do e-discovery and legal holds on it. And compliance and trust is all about making sure that our service is meeting the latest, widest compliance standards and making sure you don't have to worry about it because you know the platform you're using already meets the compliance needs you have. And trust is all about giving you full visibility into how we run the service on your behalf. We believe in full transparency, and you should know exactly how Microsoft treats your data and what kind of controls we have over it. So let's talk about platform security first. So this is all about making sure your data is safe and super secure in our data centers. We have the largest network, global network, of data centers to meet your residency, data residency and sovereignty requirements. We just announced a data center in Germany, and the last six months alone, we've introduced data centers in Canada and UK. And we will continue to expand our footprint around the globe to meet your needs, so you have more choices about where you want to st can store your data. We also give you a financially backed SLA of three nines of uptime of our service. And we store, at least, we store your data in at least two data centers in a region to, for extra redundancy. So you can be super sure that your data will always be available when you need it. We also have state-of-the-art physical security in these data centers. Our security has many layers, all the way from actually having a physical fence around the data center. We have security officers. We have very strict controls on who can, has access to our data centers. 
we have locked server racks. We actually have 24-7 surveillance. We have intrusion detection mechanisms and prevention mechanisms. The data, the physical security is super strong. Hardly anybody, very few people, actually have access to our data centers. And those who do actually have to supply multiple factors of authentication to get into the data center, including biometrics. We have a highly secure network. Only connections that are absolutely necessary to run the service are allowed into and out of the data center. We have physical isolation between the servers on which user data might be stored and the servers that have any customer external facing interfaces. So your data is protected all around. In addition to the physical security that we have, we have logical and operational security in our service. Almost all processes that are needed to manage the service and run the service are automated to reduce the amount of human access needed to run the service. The less human access you have, the less chances you have of somebody actually maliciously trying to get to your data or even accidentally getting to your data. Very few people have administrative access. Access is highly controlled. All activity performed by administrators are logged and auditable. We also have a really large super trained security team of security experts that is constantly trying to anticipate, mitigate, prevent threats. So your data, in I can say pretty confidently, your data is more secure in our cloud than it could ever be on the servers that you run yourself. Let's talk a little bit about customer lockbox. So I talked about how we strongly believe that your data is yours, we are just the caretakers. We want you to be in full control of who has access to your data and why and what are they doing. Now, no Microsoft employee has standing access to customer data. In the rare event that a Microsoft engineer needs access to your data to resolve an issue reported by you, you have full control through customer lockbox. We will request that access through customer lockbox. You can either allow it or deny it. Both the request and the access are time bound, and all activity performed during that window is logged and fully auditable. So you're in full know of what is going on, why would anybody need to access your data, and what are they doing with it. So let's see how this works. So let's say there is a Microsoft engineer who is trying to resolve an issue that is reported by you. As they're working through that issue, they realize that they need access to your data to help resolve that issue. In that case, the Microsoft engineer is going to send a request to the service to access your data. The service will first send that request to the manager of the employee who's trying to access your data so that the manager can make sure that there is a sound business justification for this access and also that there is no other way to resolve this issue without giving access to your data. If the manager approves that access, the service will then issue a request to you using customer lockbox. If you decide to approve that access, service will log that It'll log your approval. It'll log what was the reason why we asked for this request. It'll log who requested it and the time and all of that stuff so you can go back and look at it. And then the service will get the file that the engineer requested and give the file to the engineer so the engineer can resolve the issue. Now, if the engineer is not able to resolve the issue in the window for which they have access, they have to turn around and ask for access again. And you again get a chance to approve or deny. So you're always in control and you know what is going on. And of course, any activity they're doing during that time is logged and you can go back and audit it. So let's see what this actually looks like in, from um, your perspective. How will this request show up? So first, let me just show you. There is, uh, all you have to do to enable lockbox is go to admin center, settings, security and privacy. And there is a very simple on and off switch here to turn on lockbox. That's all you need to do to enable this. Once you've enabled it, let's say there is that rare event where a Microsoft engineer does need access. In that case, you will receive an email, just like I did in this case. The email will give you details about why we need access to your data. It will actually give you the service request number here right now, right here, so you can go back and look at the ticket that you opened, and you can correlate that, oh, that's why they're requiring access. Probably you're already aware by now, before you get the mail, that this issue was going on, and now we might need access. 
And if you notice, it's telling you that this approval is only, the request is only valid for 12 hours. So you have 12 hours to approve it or deny it. And if you don't, in that window, the request expires and we have to turn around and ask again. Now, if you decide you can go and approve or deny the request in the admin center, go to admin center, support, and data access requests. Click on data access request and you will actually see any pending request for your approval. And you can also see any old request that might have already expired. But there is a log that is left for you to track. So you can see any, you can go back and see the history of any requests that were made and then you can see whether you approve them or deny them. So it's pretty simple, you're in full control, you know exactly what's going on. And then if you approve the request, you can also go back and look in the audit logs to see exactly what activity was performed during that time. So moving back to the slideshow. Uh, so the question was, is this feature turned on by default or do you have to manually go and turn it on? You do have to go and turn the feature on. Yes. Um, sorry. Yes, this is an E5 feature. Um, yes, so this is an E5 feature and that's, um, like I said, it's even with an E3, we never really access your data. The question is what level of transparency you wanna have to know exactly what's going on and do you want to be in the path of approval every time or not? That's all this does actually, but it is an E5 feature. And if you don't mind, I would like to keep the questions till the end of the session. We'll have, I guarantee you, I promise you there'll be time to ask all the questions. Let's get through this so you can keep all your, but please take note of all your questions and you'll get there. Okay. so. In addition to all the physical security we have and the controls we provide you about who has access to your data, we also are very serious about how your data is actually stored. And we use encryption. The data is encrypted at rest and the data is encrypted on the wire. The data is always encrypted even when it's moving between our data centers or if it is moving from us to you or from you to us. We encrypt the volumes using BitLocker on which we actually store the data and each individual file is encrypted. In fact, each file is broken down into multiple chunks. Each chunk is encrypted with its own key, and the keys are stored separately from the file. So not that anybody can get access to your data, but even if they manage to get there, there's no way for them to read your data. There is some very, very strong encryption going on here. And we are very happy to say that before the end of this year, if you want, you will be able to bring your own encryption keys that will be used in the service. So this is another additional layer of protection and encryption on top of what we are doing. You can bring your own key, you control access to these keys. These keys are used as master keys to encrypt the per file encryption keys. And you have access to these, you control our access to these. At any time that you want, you can revoke our access to these keys. If you revoke our access to these keys, we at Microsoft and our service will not be able to decrypt the data. So in the event that you ever decide to leave the service, you can take the keys with you and that's it. There was absolutely no way for anybody to ever read your data in the service. So I just showed you how we protect your data in our data centers and the controls we give you so you know exactly who has access and you can even control the encryption that is done in the service. Now let's move on to the second pillar, which is all about secure access and sharing. This is about the controls we give you so you can make sure that only the right users are accessing the right data under the right conditions. Now this is the area where you will see the most tension between what your users want and what you want. What users want is they want to be as productive as they possibly can be at all times. They want access to all the data from all the devices all the time, they want to be able to share with anybody, they want to be able to store anything. And you know, you can understand as a user, you really want that flexibility. On the other hand, as IT, you want visibility, you want control, you want to know what's going on, you want to protect your organization's data, you want to make sure it doesn't accidentally leak, you want to make sure they don't overshare. Now, like I said, there is a lot of tension here, but in SharePoint and OneDrive, we're striving to make, sh to give your users consumer-grade usability for the product so they can easily collaborate and share and they love using the product, but at the same time giving you the control so you can have the security policies that are 
for your organizations, and they meet your organization's needs. So, but remember, in all of this, the, it's very important that you strike a balance between what the users want and what you want. Remember, there is no security without usability. It's important that any security policies that you apply, which result, if they result, in any friction in the user experience, it is commensurate to the value of the data that the user is trying to access. If the user is trying to access something that is super valuable to you, let's say it's IP of your organization, in that case, if you're going to ask the user to go through some extra steps to get to that data, maybe you're going to ask them for an additional form of authentication. Maybe they need to be on a managed device to access it. That will make sense to the user. But on the other hand, if you're going to ask them to go through those additional steps, if they're trying to access like low value data, maybe they, all they're trying to do is access their own personal trip itinerary and you're asking them to give you multiple factor of authentication, this is when they actually don't like the product and they think this is getting in their way and it's asking them to go through additional steps to do their normal work. So it's very important to make sure that you're striking the balance so that your users can be productive, but at the same time, your data is safe and secure. So from our, when we look at this, we actually look at it in two different ways. The first set of controls that we give you to make sure that your data doesn't leak out of the organization, but the users can still be productive and you can strike that balance, it's about conditional access policies. Conditional access allows you to control the level of access your users have depending upon the conditions at the time of access. So you can control who has access depending upon what device they're using, what app they're using, what location they're coming from, and the sensitivity of the data they're trying to access. So you can tailor it and make sure that you're not putting too many hurdles in their way. So let's go through this and go through each pivot and show you what controls you have to manage these five different aspects. To manage users, you can create uh, SharePoint users and you can create groups in SharePoint and you can assign access to them. If you want, you can enforce strong passwords. You can enforce multiple factors of authentication for specific users or specific security groups. And in fact, most of the conditional access policies that I'm gonna talk about after this, you can assign them to specific users or security groups. So if you have users with different levels of trust, you can create security groups for them and apply policies to specific security groups. We also have controls that help you manage the level of access depending upon the device and the application the users are using. Using Microsoft Intune, you can manage SharePoint and OneDrive mobile apps on both managed and unmanaged devices. So if your users are using personal mobile devices, you can still manage the SharePoint and OneDrive app on those devices. And you can decide the level of access user will have and what operations are allowed to be performed in those apps. We'll show you how this works in a few minutes. You can also control the level of access your users can have from a non-domain joined or a non-compliant device. And you can give them different level of granular access depending upon the needs of your organization. I mentioned Intune, so I think it's better for me to just say this outright. We definitely work the best with Microsoft Intune and have the best integration, but we do work with other enterprise mobility management software you might have in your organization. Just the level of integration might be a little different, but we do work with them. So now I'm going to invite Kavita Kamani, a program manager on SharePoint and OneDrive team, to join me in showing you how this actually works. So we're gonna take you through conditional access policies for devices and applications. So first I'm going to show you how as an admin you set up these policies and then Kavita is gonna show you what is the resulting end user experience. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna show you is how do you set up policies in Intune to manage SharePoint and OneDrive apps. So here I am in the Intune portal, and as you can see in my organization, I've created two policies. I have one policy to control the iOS devices in, that people might be using in my organization, and I have another policy to control Android devices. I'm gonna take you through the iOS policy. For the iOS policy, creating a policy is very simple. All you have to do is you give a name to your policy, 
Once you pick a name, I've picked a very simple name. It's an iOS mobile application management policy. You can assign it to certain user groups. In my case, I've created a user group called MAM, and I've put the users that I think should be impacted by this policy into this user group. And then you can decide which applications you want to target with this policy. In my case, I have actually selected, obviously, the SharePoint and the OneDrive app, but I've also selected other Office apps. And if you notice, the list is actually a little longer. So if you want it, Intune allows you to manage other apps as well. But I'm going to focus primarily on SharePoint and OneDrive here. So that's what I've done. I've selected SharePoint and OneDrive app, and I've selected all the Office apps. And then you say, what kind of policies do you want to apply to these apps? So I've selected some simple things. The thing what I'm trying to show you is what we're trying to prevent is accidental leaking of data from these managed apps onto other potentially insecure apps that the user might be running on their personal device. So you're controlling the SharePoint and OneDrive app, but they obviously have other apps running on the device. And you control these apps so you can trust them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that the data never leaks these apps. And the way I do that, I can set a policy which essentially says restrict, cut, copy, and paste with other apps. So I've set a policy which says you're only allowed to copy data between managed apps. Data cannot leave the managed app boundary. I trust those apps, I manage them, those are fine, but you cannot make, take my data outside these apps. So you can be absolutely productive inside the SharePoint and OneDrive app, you just can't take the data out of the apps. I've also said that I require you to use a pin. If you're going to use this app to access organization data, I want to make sure you've at least set a pin. It's safe. I want to make sure the pin has certain length. I've specified four digits. And I'm saying it's OK for you to use fingerprints instead of pin. So this is just about usability. If your users have a fingerprint reader, allow them access. And then I've set a simple timeout. Every one minute of inactivity, you'll be prompted to supply your pin or fingerprint again. And I think this is pretty simple. Users know how to use it. And this is pretty sufficient in making sure that the data doesn't leave the applications. So now I'm going to shift to Kavita, who's going to show you what this actually looks like on a user's device. Let me switch over to the phone here. So like many of you, I use my personal iPhone to access company data on the go. So here, I'm using the OneDrive app on my phone. And even though my phone is not managed by my organization, the app is, because I signed into it using my organizational ID, and that's when the policies kicked in. So when I launched the OneDrive app, it asks me to enter the PIN, like Navjot said. It's a four-digit PIN. Once I enter the PIN, I'm in. And the PIN provides a second layer of protection for the company data that's in the app. Once I'm in, I can see all of my OneDrive for Business documents. And I've been working on a spec for the next version of our product. It's still in draft state, so I haven't put it on the team site yet. But I do want to get some feedback on a particular section from Navjot. So what I'm going to do is open that file. And that opens in PowerPoint. And this is still within the one minute timeout, so it doesn't prompt me for a pin right here. But what I want to do is copy the goal, the snippet here, and send it to Navjot. So I selected this section, and I hit Copy. And now I'm going to go to the Mail app, which is the native Mail app on the iPhone. And notice how there is no Paste option enabled here. And that's because what I tried to do is copy data from the OneDrive app, which is a managed app, and I was trying, or the PowerPoint app, which is a managed app, and I was trying to paste that into the mail app, which is an unmanaged app. So this makes sense. I'll go back to the OneDrive app and go share the file from there securely. And since a minute has passed now, it does ask me for the pin again. So once I'm in, I can select the file here and hit the share button. Hit invite people, and I'm going to email this to share this with Navjot from right here in the app. And now I managed to share the file securely with her using this app. So in summary, what the OneDrive app allowed me, I don't want to read this app, though I believe it is a five-star app. Uh, <laughs> In summary, the OneDrive app allowed me to be productive on my phone and access company data, but it has the right guards built in, so I don't leak data accidentally from the app into some other app that it doesn't trust. OK, so the next thing we're going to show you Let's is. Over oh, what number are you? Oh, yeah, sorry. Six, thank you. OK, 
So the next thing I want to show you, so we just showed you how you can manage your apps and the level of access your users can have on these apps, even on unmanaged devices. So the next thing I'm going to show you is a conditional access policy that allows you to control the level of access your users have when they're using a non-domain join or a non-compliant device. So in this case, now we know that your users have a strong desire to be productive on all of their devices. So you can, the, the policy allows you, if you want, you can give your users full access even when they're coming from a non-domain joint or a non-compliant device, uh, which is probably a lot for a lot of you that might be too much, but if it works for your organization, great. Or you can block all access. But what we really want to do is allow you to enable your users to be more productive on these devices. We want you to keep your data safe, but let them be productive. And that's why we've introduced a new level of access. So if you want, you can grant your users limited access on these devices. What this does is it allows your users to only access the data in a browser. And even when they're in the browser, they're not allowed to download, uh, sync, or print. So the idea is that I can use these devices, I can be productive, but there is no way for me to take the data from the service and store it on one of these devices or even accidentally leave it on these devices because these can be potentially insecure devices. So here I've set that policy. And let's see how that works for an end user. Back to you, Kavita. So can you press number seven? Yeah. OK, so this is my work PC. And I'm in a team site. And as you can see, I have access to sync files. I have access to download the file. I can open it. And I have edit access. I have the ability to print. You know, even with the browser print function, I can go here. I have the preview here. I can do everything, as you would expect. So this is my work device. It is a fully compliant device, and I have full access. Now, I switch over to my home PC, which is, which is this one. Okay. So I'm at home. I'm checking mail. And Navjot and I were collaborating on this document, so she sends me a note saying, Hey, Kavita, I made some final changes to the notes. Need to get the sent out end of day today. Can you give it a final read? So she's included a link here, so let me just click that. It's very handy. But now you see that I'm on, a, on my home PC, so I see this yellow bar. And it says, your organization doesn't allow you to download, print, or sync using this device. To use these actions, use a device that's joined to a domain. So it's a very clear message for me. But I can still access my OneDrive and or my team site here. And I can view the files in here. I know we're working on the meeting notes document, so I'm gonna, I can open it. I see no sync option here. I see no option to do download. When I open the file, edit is disabled. Is I don't see an edit option. I can share it if I want to. And you know, if I try to go to the browser print thing, I see no preview. So, I am able to be productive at home. I can view it. I can give it a final read. I can respond to her and saying, yep, we are good to go. Let's share this out. Or I can share it right from here. But I have limited access because this device does not meet my, meet my organization's compliance policies. OK, so now we're going to switch back. Uh, so we just showed you how you can control the level of access your user has from an unmanaged device that is not domain joined nor compliant. So we've just shown you you can control users' mobile devices, you can control their PCs as well. So you can actually allow them to be productive but still keep your data safe. Now let's talk about conditional access based on the location that the user is coming from. So that's the next policy that we're gonna talk about. This is a slightly more restrictive policy. I encourage you to use it very carefully. It makes sense for certain organization and probably for certain type of data. So if you are an organization that has very strict regulatory requirements maybe that your data should only be accessed on networks which meet certain security standards, or you're an organization with a lot of very sensitive data, maybe you're a financial institution and you have users' financial data, and you want to make sure that it is only accessible on your corporate network that meets your security standards, then you can set this policy. This policy is a very simple enable disable policy only. Uh, where is my mouse? Can you guys see it? Okay, we have lost access to my mouse. Give me a second. Mm -hmm. okay. There 
there you go. Okay. So this is a very simple enable disable policy. To enable the policy, all you have to do is supply the IP ranges that you trust. So get the IP ranges of the networks that you trust, maybe the IP ranges that define your corporate network, or if there are more, you can just supply them. It's a comma separated list. You supply the list of the IP ranges that you trust, set the policy, and after that, the user will only have access when they're on one of these networks. The moment they leave these networks, they will lose access. When they come back to the network, they will regain access. So Kavita is going to show you what this looks like. I'm actually going to enable the policy now. Um, obviously, be careful with this policy. Make sure you've got your IP ranges correctly configured. You could accidentally lock yourself out. So make sure you know your IP ranges. Okay. Can you switch to seven for me? Yes. OK, so I'm back on my work PC. I am physically on the carpet network right here, and I'm, I have full access. You know, I, let me refresh, make sure this is, you know, I still have access. I can go open a file. I have full access here. Okay, so I'm going to do something you should never do on stage in a demo. I'm gonna take this network out. So now I'm off my you know, work corporate network, and did I also get lose the HDMI? I lose, lost the HDMI, sorry. That you could do, but I want to take, get rid of this one, which is my network. Okay, so now I'm going to simulate like as if I'm traveling, I'm at the airport. We always like to be productive on the go, so I'm going to find the airport hotspot, which is not necessarily secure, and I'm going to connect to it. So I have this hotspot, and I'm going to connect to that network now. And you know, I should have researched some jokes about the debate last night, but I didn't. Uh, but that's good, it's connected now. So now, if I refresh, hopefully, the policy, connected here. Just one second, we're gonna do this. You wanna go back to the admin, I'm going to just check my IP address here to make sure that You're not connected all good. to the Wi-Fi on the... I am not connected to the Wi-Fi on this. Let me make sure. We're gonna I go back to, and I'm just thinking. Give me one second, hold on. Address is 107. Just making sure the policy got applied. Okay, that's it. Well, like we said, this is a very dangerous demo. You should be very careful yeah. about <laughs> changing networks when you're doing this. I did take the right cable off, of course. It's not connected to it, so I'm not connected to it. Okay, you know what? We're just going to make sure we disconnect, connect one more time. And then let's make sure the policy got applied. Oh, you know, I'll give it one final shot. So <laughs> let me, okay. I'm gonna get rid of this completely. For those of you who were in the session yesterday in Jeff's session, we did this successfully. This is obviously currently in uh, testing. Is, we uh, Actually, it's available for limited preview to some of our customers who are testing it with us. It's a difficult policy to get right, like I said. Uh, so it does work, bear with us. And if it doesn't, I'm happy to show this to you offline as well. Demos are always I also hard to rebooted do. this thing <laughs> here, so now. So we'll try it one more time. So now I'm at the airport again. <laughs> we travel a lot. And I guess I can be productive at the airport. Um, so we need to figure out, we'll troubleshoot this. Uh, but this should have given me an access denied page. Um, and it didn't. 
Okay, we probably just got the network IP ranges wrong on my side, so it could be my yeah. fault. Uh, I don't. Are you in private mode? You are in private mode. I am in mode. private mode. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You need to have lots of IT professionals you in know, the audience to help you debug it live. I am going this to go great. to Chrome. So this is not my network, not my browser. And OK. <laughs> See, now, now I feel good. OK. So as much as Apologies. I as Not much, that we recommend you use Chrome. Exactly. Please use IE and but, use Edge. <laughs> this really has nothing to do with the browser. We do recommend you rate the app five stars, but yes. not use Chrome. Uh, but anyway, so I, as much as I like to be productive all the time, in this case, the, the policy kicked in, and you know it, it blocked access to me on an unmanaged network. And now, hopefully, this part works. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely. let me copy the URL since this is all cached here. I'm going to open. OK, now I'm on this network. So you can click on it. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now that yeah. works, yeah. So, Edge works too, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so now I'm going to do connect back to the network, and I'm gonna show you how seamless it is to get back full access when I'm back at work, or once I VPN in and I'm back on a managed network. And there I'm in, so. So basically what happened is that when I moved networks to an unmanaged network, the policy kick didn't block full access. When I got back on a managed network, I now have access. We're going to switch back. So I think we just showed you a bunch of conditional access policies in SharePoint and OneDrive that allow you to control the level of access your users have depending upon the device, the application, the location they're using. Um, now, and this basically is meant so that you can control and prevent any accidental leakage of data into insecure devices, locations, or apps. Now we're going to talk about how you can prevent oversharing in your organization. So SharePoint and OneDrive give you controls so you can prevent oversharing, but at the same time allow your users to collaborate with others, both within and outside the organization. You can decide the level of sharing that works for your organization. We have a bunch of controls for you. You can restrict who can share with whom. You can decide who are the users in your organization that are allowed to share externally. You can pick individual users. You can restrict security groups. You can decide who they can share with. You as an admin can set an allow or a deny domain list that the users are allowed to share with. Or if you want, you can restrict your users to only be allowed to share with external users that are explicitly invited by you and added to your Active Directory and they're visible to their users. You can also restrict what data can be shared with external users. You can disable external sharing at site level or you can disable external sharing at your tenant level. Yesterday I showed this briefly, uh, if you were in our session uh, that Jeff was doing, uh, we mentioned site classification. So if you have a site that you've classified and you think that this site has confidential data or very important data for your organization, you can actually programmatically set policies and disable external sharing on those sites. So you can control what data is allowed to be shared externally. You can also restrict what an external user is allowed to do. You can do things like you can restrict your external users from resharing the data that is shared with you. You can restrict how long they have access to the data that is shared with you. I'll show you how you can do that. You can restrict what kind of access they can have. So you can restrict the level of access a user is allowed to give to an external user. So I, as a user, may try to share it with full access to you, but organizational policy can kick in, and you can force the external user to only have a view-only mode. So you have a lot of control on who can share with whom and what they can do after they actually get access to that data. And the last pivot that we mentioned, we do think that some of these policies make sense depending upon the sensitivity of the data that the user is trying to access or share. Using Office 365 data loss protection policies or DLP policies, you can automatically classify your data. You can specify what you consider is sensitive. DLP comes with built-in over 80 types of sensitivities that you can use easily, or you can specify your own sensitivity type. And once you set the policy, it will automatically classify your data based on the sensitivity settings you've set. And if you want, you can block internal sharing or all external sharing of sensitive data. 
So this is where you can actually apply granular control. So instead of blocking sharing of all data in your organization, you can block sharing of just the sensitive data in your organization. So let me show you how you set this up, and then Kavita will take you through what the end user experience is once this is set. So let's go back to the admin again, and let's look at the policies. Uh, so the first thing I want to show you are sharing policies. So here I am in the SharePoint Admin Center. There is a sharing tab. You click on it, and there are a bunch of policies to help you control sharing. So if you want, you can just disable all sharing at your external sharing at your organizational level. So I'm in the tenant admin, so this setting is for the whole tenant, but you also have this setting at the site level. Or you can only allow sharing with users that you have invited. So you can specify a list of users that you want to import into your Active Directory that are external users, and they're visible to your users in the sharing uh, UX, and they can share with them. If you want, you can control the level of um, access that the, these users will have, the ones with whom the data is actually shared, who are outside your organization. So you can decide whether anonymous links are allowed or not, whether you're going to allow explicit sharing only. You can actually set a policy which says, how long is the anonymous link valid for? So in my case, I've set it to 30 days. So if you think that your users tend to collaborate a lot with external users, but these are short-living projects, you can set this policy to make sure that after some time, the external users do lose access, and they do not continue to have access. But you can allow anonymous sharing for 30 days, so it makes it really easy for people to collaborate. And at the same time, you can also decide what kind of access you want to allow these external users to have. You can give them a view access or view and edit access. And similarly, at folder level, when somebody's sharing a folder externally, you can decide whether they have view access or view, edit, and download access. And I mentioned a little while back that you can also control, if you, don't, if you want to allow external sharing, but you, know, you want to be broader than just the users you've invited, you can specify the domains that the users are allowed to share with. This is an allow or a deny list. In my case, I have set it as a deny list, which says you're not allowed to share with anybody on the Gmail domain. I'm essentially, this is an example of a policy where you're trying to say, do not share with users' personal email. You must use some sort of a corporate email. So that's what I've done here. I've blocked all sharing with Gmail. And uh, we also have some notifications here, especially for OneDrive, and you're sharing. You can actually receive notification back to figure out if somebody shares what you've shared with them and when they actually get access to it. So a lot more visibility and controls around sharing. Now I'm going to show you how you can set the data loss prevention policies, which uh, we just talked about around sensitive data. So like I said, it's very easy. Here I am in the Security and Compliance Center. I'm in data loss prevention. And you can quickly create a policy. I already have two policies here, but I can show you how easy it is to create another policy. You click Create. Sorry, it's going to ask me to sign in again. That is fine. Okay, let's do this again. So I'm going to hit Create. It's going to ask me what kind of data do I want to protect. So like I said, there is some very pre-built um, sensitivity types already, so it makes it very easy. So I'm going to pick a simple thing. I'm going to say, oh, it's financial data. Sure, let's say it's very US specific, so I'm going to pick US financial data. And it's telling me what kind of data it will protect. It understands the US financial data. It understands this kind of information it can protect automatically. I click Next. It asks me to supply a name, a description. The one we have by default seems pretty good for me. I'm going to say Next. It says, OK, where do you want this policy to apply? And this is an Office 365 wide policy. So you can apply it across SharePoint, OneDrive, and Exchange. So not only can you prevent sharing of this data from OneDrive and SharePoint, you can also prevent users from sending it as an attachment in Outlook. So it really is pretty comprehensive. So I'm going to say, OK, let me choose. Turns out OneDrive is not included. Absolutely, I want to protect OneDrive as well. Say Next. And it says, OK, do you want to use simple settings? So like, yeah, I'm totally fine. Just use the simple settings. Or you can change them and actually add more sensitivity types if you want. Then it says, detect when this content is shared with others. And yes, what I am trying to do in my case is prevent external sharing of this sensitive data. So I'm going to say, yes, please detect when this content is shared with people outside my organization. And then how do I want to protect the content? Well, what I want to do is I want to block people from sharing and restrict access to this shared content. And I'm actually, uh, so now what this is going to do is this is going to block all external sharing and access 
to sensitive documents in my organization by an external user. But remember the usability thing we were talking about? Sometimes there might be a real business need for somebody to do this. And if you set this policy across your entire tenancy, you might want to give your users the ability to actually come back and negotiate with you and say, well, in my case, it's justified. I would like to do this. So what this says is let people who see this tip override the policy or not. So you can decide whether you want them to give you a business justification to override, or you can allow them to override anyway. So you can decide what works for your organization. So I'm going to just hit next. And it'll before it applies the policy, it gives you the ability to test it out, which I highly recommend. So you can see how this is going to work, so you don't accidentally over block things or rely, find out that you actually uh, your selection of sensitivity wasn't wide enough. So try it out. And during that time, it shows the tips. You can see what it is like. And if you feel good about what it's done, it'll let you review the stuff once, and you can create the policy. So pretty simple. Now let's see what this looks like from an end user perspective, the sharing controls and this DLP policy. So back to Kavita. So this is now less risky than pulling out cables. I'm seven. feeling good about seven. this. Yeah, seven. Okay. So I'm back on my team site. Um, and I have access to all of my files back on my compliant device, full access and everything. Um, I've been working on getting some customer feedback on the spec that I was saying that I'm working on. So I want to share that information, share the insights from it with a few people. So what I'm going to do is select that file, hit share, and I'm going to share that with Navjot, who is in the organization, so an internal employee, and I'm going to share this with a partner at Fabricam who we work with. So I'm going to send this to Samir at gmail.com. I hope you hear me. <laughs> uh, OK. So now you can see that the policy that Navjot showed kicked in. And it says that I'm not allowed to share with Samir at gmail.com. And the error message is very clear here to me. And frankly, I shouldn't really have done this. I shouldn't have sent this to his personal email. But as lazy as I am, I typed that because, oh, Start over, so I'll hit share. And this time I'll type Navjot. And I'll type Samir Yadav at fabricam.com, which is his work email. And now I don't get a block. I do get a notice that he's outside of my organization, but as a user, I can choose if this data makes sense for me to share with him. And I can hit the share button. So in this particular case, when I tried to share with the gmail.com address, I got a very clear error message. That's not permitted. Sharing was blocked. And then when I chose a work email, which is in the allowed list of domains, then I'm able to share that successfully. Now, let me hit share. The other thing I want to do is you know, the first round of customer feedback was so good, I want to target the next round of customers. And Samir is the guy who's helping me with the survey logistics. So now on my, on my OneDrive, and I have this file. As you can see, there is some icon, but I don't really know what it is. So I'm going to click it, and I'm going to share this file out. And this time, having learned the lesson, I'm going to send it to Samir Yadav at fabricam.com. And I expected it to work. But now I get an error saying, he's outside of your organization, and this item contains some sensitive information. So it cannot be shared with people outside of the organization. As a user, that, that error makes sense. I can click View Policy Tip. I get a few more details. And it tells me that this item contains the following sensitive information, credit card numbers. So I can show you the document. And in this case, I'm completely blocked from sharing this file. When I open the document, I am giving him a lot more than just the customer information that he needs to reach out to the to survey. I'm giving him all of this stuff. So in this case, I was accidentally sharing information and oversharing information that I should not have shared. And I'm thankful the policy kicked in, told me very clearly why this doesn't match, blocked me from sharing it, even though I'm otherwise I have full access to it. Okay. 
you can you can set yes. customized uh, sensitivity types, and you can now start. Uh, I think it's shipping before the end of the year. You can actually create your own sensitivity types that you can define using regular expressions. Yes. Yeah. We Gee. keep the questions till the end of the session. Let's get through. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so switching back. So what we just showed you were controls that allow you to manage the way sharing and access is working in your organization. So you can prevent accidental oversharing. You can prevent accidental leaking of data to devices and locations you don't trust. So, but in all of these cases, we made sure that there was very good usability. So your users are mostly productive. And when they are not allowed to do something, they're well educated and informed about what is going on. So it seems like fair to them and they understand how to handle that particular situation. So we focus heavily on user education and also in actually providing the usability that makes sense for the users. Now switching gears, talking about insights. So this is another pillar that we uh, think about a lot when we're thinking about security. And this is about giving you insights into how users are using SharePoint and OneDrive in your organization. So you can know what they're doing. You can f have, make informed decisions. And you can actually try and get more value, understand how to get more value out of your Office 365 subscription. For reporting, we actually have full usage dashboards that I will show you just in a minute. You have tenant level, user level reporting. And for auditing, every user and file action taken in SharePoint and OneDrive is logged and is auditable. We just announced yesterday that we are going to ship hybrid or unified auditing for our hybrid customers in Feature Pack 1, shipping in November. So you have one place to see your audit logs from on-premise and online, so you can get a view of your entire organization in one single location. And we also have management APIs that allow you to export these logs, and you can actually use whatever your favorite tools you might have for visualization on top of it and other actions you might want to take. So I'm going to switch gears and show you what this looks like. So I'm going to go back to admin again. And let's look at the usage reports. So here I am in Office 365 Admin Center. I'm looking at usage reports. Usage reports has two tiles, one for OneDrive and one for SharePoint. It is actually giving me a very clear insight of how many users are actually using SharePoint and OneDrive in my organization. So you can figure out. In my case, I might decide to do some user outreach and education to try and get the usage to go up. Um, you can also see what kind of activity they're performing. In my tenancy, I can see that there are lots of views and edits happening in SharePoint. Uh, and there is very little external sharing happening. But frankly, as an admin, it makes me feel good. Less external sharing, probably. There is less chances of data leaking out. But on the other hand, you know, if you're an organization where you think that most of your users work a lot with external vendors or external partners, this might be an insight where you're wondering what are they using for external sharing. I can also get a very good understanding of how much storage is being used, like uh, how are people actually, how much data are they actually storing in SharePoint and OneDrive. And if I click on these tiles, they actually give me more insights. I can get user insights as well. I can actually look at the users, see who is using how much, what kind of activities are they performing. I can get a sense of who's sharing, who's syncing, how much data are they actually storing. I can see the last time they accessed. So I can get some insights into what my users are doing. I can also see file activity. I can see um, you, number of users who are active. I can see this over seven days, 90 days, 180 days. So I can expand my windows or reduce my windows of insights that I want to do. And you have similar insights for uh, OneDrive as well as applicable. Obviously, they are catered to the particular workload. So the idea here is give you more visibility. You can understand. You can take actions. And you can actually try and figure out how to get more value out of your Office 365 subscription. Next thing I want to show you is auditing. So like I just mentioned, every user file activity gets logged. You can actually go and search for it. And now this works across on-premise and online. So, And you can search for all kinds of activities. Uh, you, we actually show you all sharing and access related activities as well. So you can get a good insight into who's doing what, who's sharing, how much when people share, what kind of sharing are they doing? Who accepted the sharing link? When did they actually access it? Full uh, control. You can actually see sync activities. But for now, let's say I'm just interested in looking at all the deletes that have happened in my organization. So I'm going to select all the delete. I'm only going to select the deleted activity. I get to specify a range. 
So this is a big range. Since I want to do a live demo, I'm going to pick a smaller range and make sure that the results come back quickly. There is a lot of activity that happens, obviously. Um, and, I, and if I want, I can actually set alerts. I can set custom alerts to be notified whenever certain specific activity happens in my organization. So if there's something very specific you're looking for, you can actually set an alert and get notified when it happens. So in this case, I'm just going to do search. It's going to take a few seconds as expected. It's going through a lot of data, and it's going to give me the results only for the window that I've asked for. It's going to search for on-premise and online, combine the results, and show me everything in one place. So it's loading. Here. So now I've got results. Here you can see that there is some activity. Jeff did some deletes against the online SharePoint. I can also see that there are some deletes here that have happened. Sesha did some deletes in the on-premises um, deployment. So I'm seeing results from both on-premises and online all in one place. And in fact, I did this yesterday, so here goes Jeff's day again. Um, I'm noticing that Jeff did a lot of deletes, which just seems a bit suspicious. It's not like him. And maybe there's something going on. So while I try to figure out what's going on, just to be on the safer side, I'm actually going to terminate all of Jeff's active sessions across all devices, all active sessions to Office 365, and force him to re-authenticate, just to make sure it is Jeff. And then I'll try to figure out what has happened. But this is also very simple. All I have to do is go to Admin Center, select your users, go to Active Users, pick the user. In this case, I'm going to kick out Jeff Teeper. So I'm going to select Jeff. and I'm going to click on sign out. I can initiate a sign out as an admin for him and he will be forced to log out of all of his Office 365 sessions across all of his devices. And that's it. I hope Jeff has a good day. <laughs> so I've just shown you that we, can, we are giving you insights into how SharePoint and OneDrive is used in your organization. And you can actually use that to make more informed decisions you can uh, make your users more productive, you can get more value out of your Office 365 subscription, and you can even take, you can do auditing across on-premise and online, and you can even take actions. And now, I'm going to transition. I'm going to call Chris McNulty, Product Manager for SharePoint and OneDrive, to actually take you through information governance and compliance and trust features in SharePoint and OneDrive. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Navjot. Good morning, folks. So, you know, go governance is a very interesting topic, and, you know, I've been s speaking in the SharePoint community for years, and starting five or six years ago, it seemed that any time two or more people gathered to talk about SharePoint, the word governance had to come up. And one of the things that we're really seeing, you know, we're really excited at Microsoft um, watching the takeoff of SharePoint in the marketplace yet again, and the explosion of with groups of sites and so forth, governance becomes really important. The focus for governance, it, to distinguish what we've been talking about in some of the other pillars, in some of the other places we're talking about controlling and shaping user behavior and endpoint behavior. This is really a discipline about the content itself and how we're shaping where it belongs in the site. So one of the most important things that we can focus on is data retention, understanding how long, based upon classifications, we apply to the data. We want to keep that information in the organization. And this is a topic that SharePoint's been blazing a trail on for a number of years. And one of the things that we're really pleased to be able to share with you here at Ignite this week is kind of how we're rolling that out across all of Office 365 to allow you to apply consistent policies across not just your OneDrive and SharePoint content, but also your email messages from Exchange and the information that you have in Skype. Being able to build those policies out and then apply rules for how long information should be kept based upon user scene classification as well as the properties of the data that's out there. Um, this also can force deletion at a certain period of time. So there may be classes of information that usually for legal and compliance reasons, um, we might want to say that certain contracts or certain other document types, I might want to say after five years we don't want to retain them and you can use re data retention policies to enforce some of those same restrictions right now. So let me jump over here to my machine. 
When it comes to retention policies, it's probably also important for me to note, um, I'm not a lawyer, nor do I play one on television. Um, my parents were the lawyers in the family, and I'll get to more of that when we're talking about e-discovery here in just a moment. So let's log in on this. And so when we're looking at these capabilities, the place where we stitch them together is inside the Office 365 Security and Compliance Center. So we can see a number of classifications that I've already created. I'm going to go and create a new one out here right now. And the wizard is going to walk me through the process of building a new classification here. So let's create a new classification for um, predictions that we might make about the market. And I can put a friendly description into it. And it's going to ask me, when I apply this, do you want to preserve the content? And in this case, I can say, I want to keep the content for you know, one year, three years, five years, um, and automatically delete it after that period of time. My predictions are not very good. I usually tend to predict that my New England Patriots will win every year in the Super Bowl. We only win four of them so far. So I don't want to be held to all of those predictions. So I may want to say, after a year, delete it so no one can ever show me that this is going on right now. Um, you can also enforce deletion without preservation here in the rule set. And we can tie that back to creation, modified date, or tagging date. And then finally, we get to see a review of where, what have I done to create this tag. And once this, once this tag is created, um, after the timer job propagates it appropriately, I can then consume that tag in through Outlook, in through Skype, as well as what I'm able to get to through SharePoint. So let's take a quick look at what that looks like on the SharePoint side. Here inside of a modern team site where I have a document library, let's jump over to my strategy docs area. One of the reasons why we move forward with modernization of team sites and libraries and responsive design is the ability for us to add this um, design panel here on the right side of the screen where I can start to look at information that's out there. So if I'm looking at my strategy docs here, you can see I have a global takeover doc that I've specified here. And this is where I can say I can apply a classification. And the user is given, we give you guidance right here based on how you set the tag up to is this press materials, for how long this is going to be kept. So we could say if this material is for the press, we're going to save this for three years. We want to make that interactive for people. You know, we think one of the important th concepts of, go of governance is it is a balance between runaway usage and users running away. Um, and during my years when I was with Dell as a CTO, one of the things we talked about in governance was the balance between empowering users and empowering the organization to balance those two things out. Users can be very clever about figuring out ways to do, get their work done in unanticipated directions. So as much as we can empower people, what we talk about people-centric compliance is helping people understand what's going on. And one of the places where we surface that is right here. If I want to add a new column here, one of the columns that we have that, to make it visible is the protection tag. So in addition to being able to do this in an automatic, automatic fashion, we're able to show people directly as they're working with content what the intention is for how that long information should be kept. The more we can inform people, the more we believe that, that people will be able to make better decisions about their own governance as well as the governance that we impose coming from up top. So let me jump back into my presentation here. So, I mentioned before my parents were both lawyers. So during breaks in college, I managed to make an awful lot, uh, not, I wouldn't say I made an awful lot of money, but consume an awful lot of time working on um, litigation and, and discovery cases. Um, I will reveal my age. You know, I had watched LA Law, and I sort of thought, oh, being a lawyer sounds really great. Look at all of the fabulous people on television, and then discovered how much uh, the law is really about plowing through mounds and mounds and mounds of documents. One of the things that we know is that the more we're in a globally connected world and the more that your content is exposed to different jurisdictions, um, compliance and legal needs 
can be ever more at the forefront of how we govern the information that's out there. That's why we think it's important to introduce simple and intelligent tooling to simplify and speed up the process of finding information that may be subject to subpoenas or other kinds of compliance um, activities, put them on hold, and be able to review them and export them. It's important that in most organizations, this is not an IT function. This is a legal or compliance function. So it is driven through the Security and Compliance Center in Office 365, so you can delegate that control to the appropriate people in the organization. And again, this is a, this is a design surface that is maintained throughout all of Office 365 beyond just SharePoint, so we can extend many of the same discovery capabilities into Exchange as well. One of the things that we've also been able to do is you can run searches interactively and then pass them on using our advanced e-discovery capabilities to apply machine learning and get even greater precision and ongoing searches around what's going on in the background. So I can show you a screenshot of this, but I think it's probably more important that we jump directly in and take a look at what this looks like live. So. Just very quickly, eDiscovery is driven from the Security and Compliance Center inside Office 365, which you can always get to at the waffle right here. Under Search and Investigation, we can drill into eDiscovery. And here we can, for example, get to a case involving our attempted divestiture of Fabricam from the rest of Contoso. Um, when this screen comes up here, um, this obviously will run faster than an entire summer waiting through documents. And here we see. Uh, a brand new error, wonderful. Um, but here we have a case that I've already created in the Fabricam divestiture. If we go in and take a look at it, what we can see is that I've already built a search that's out there looking for, and I can see that this search has already been run earlier this morning. We found 26 items related to Fabricam right now. And from here, I have the option of being able to create a new hold to freeze that content while someone is working with it. I also can take that and export it and be if I choose to, based on what I see for a search. So drilling back into the search, I can see here's the search results. It should come up on the screen. It's re-executing the search right now, waiting through all the information, using all the power of our search capabilities to be able to allow someone administratively, who might not be part of IT, but to be able to look at the content, get a preview, and start making determinations about what should be subject to hold or exported for further review. And that's the, go the, the summary of what we're rolling out with eDiscovery. And lastly, we turn to compliance and trust. We regard ourselves as pioneers in the number of certifications that we've been able to go out and collect. And so we see trust as a value that we earn over time. We can't sell you trust. Trust is something that we have to develop in our relationships with you. We are only the custodians of your data, and it's one of the things that we want to make very clear about how we project that information out. So one of the things that we do is we go out and we seek independent validation of what we are doing with information security. We are continuously trying to assess our compliance, our fitness, with a number of regulatory regimes, not just here in the US, but globally. Things like our support for EU safe harbor, data processing agreement, ISO certifications like 27001, et cetera. I can read lots of these eye charts to use and so forth. But we have massive teams of people dedicated to that. And that's something that we want to handle transparently. So if you read our blog posts yesterday, one of our key blog posts, if you visit us at blogs.office.com, is about what we're doing for security, privacy, and compliance in SharePoint and Office 365. And we're really proud to be able to introduce there a white paper to summarize all of the information that we have right, we're presenting today. So that if you are looking for guidance to give to your business partners or your technical partners about why we regard SharePoint and OneDrive as the safest, most compliant place that we can find 
for your information, I'd encourage you to visit our blogs and take a look at that information that's right out there. We are very proud of the breadth of not only our data centers, but our data center certifications. And we maintain all of that information tra as transparently as possible. If you visit us at the Office 365 Protection Center, you'll be able to take a look at our audit reports, take a look at where we are with our data processing agreements, and be able to inspect our own certifications through the Office 365 Trust Center. That's available. We have a short link here right now at aca.ms-065 Trust Center. If you visit the Trust Center, you can you can see all the information that we make publicly available. I'm walking too far away from my thing here. Um, all the certifications that we make available that you can review how we are maintaining this information. It is a core philosophy for us that we have custody of the data. We do not own the data. We want to make sure that we're clear about our controls and are providing you with as many of the controls as you need as possible to secure and maintain your information. Um, so that said, I'm going to wrap up here quickly by pointing you back to the Office 365 Trust Center for more information. And I'm going to invite Navjot to rejoin us back here on the stage and bring us through the wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. OK, so I want to leave some time for Q&A. So I'm going to quickly go through this, just summarize all the things we talked about. So our core five pillars. Platform security, making sure your data is super safe in our data centers. You have all the control over who has access and encryption. Secure access and sharing so you can make sure only the right users have access to the right things. Awareness and insight so you know how they're using SharePoint and OneDrive, how you can get more value out of it. Information governance so you actually can control the life cycle of the data in your organization and do retention holds and things like that. And compliance and trust. Um, Roadmap, I wanted to quickly give you a little bit of an insight into what's coming over the next few months. Uh, we talked about you'll be able to bring your own encryption keys. This is, is coming, all of these things are coming by the end of this year. Um, locking sharing of sensitive documents, new conditional access policies we just showed you, time bound sharing, expiration and resharing controls, awareness and insights. We just talked about the new reports that I showed you. Um, unified logging across hybrid and on, for hybrid across on-prem and online, um, retention-based tagging, and of course we announced the German data center. So these are just some of the things that are coming before the end of this year. There's a lot more coming after that too. Uh, we have a bunch of other talks that are also happening related to this. So if you're interested, please take a look at those as well and try and you can either see them online or go attend them in person. Um, but with that, we would love for you to give feedback uh, please let us know. We would love to hear how we did, and we would also love to answer any questions you might have. And thank you so much for attending. I'm going to ask Kavita and Chris to join me too, so if you have any questions, all three of us are happy to answer them. Hey, will the conditional access controls require Azure Active Directory Premium? Sorry, say that again? The conditional access, the location-based access controls, will they require Azure Active Directory Premium? The location-based control actually does not. We have some policies built in directly into SharePoint, but the policies that you get into SharePoint are more rudimentary, I would say. The location-based policy you can set in SharePoint or in AAD Premium, and they are compatible. Uh, but for that one policy, you don't need Azure AD Premium. Great. Thank you. Uh, hi. I have three questions over here. Uh, on your left. Yes. Oh. Yeah, stays You're on the left. left. OK, but on blocking. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's OK. Three questions. Blocking. How does it handle encrypted files? Um, the second one, the logs you talked about in auditing, are they saved in my tenant? Is all that log information go adding up against my data storage? And three, the protection tag that you showed, uh, how is that created? That's a custom tag. Is it, you know, how is it created in okay. the field? So the first question was, sorry, there were three questions. What was the yeah, the your sensitive data, um, PN, PN, PNN PLP data. Policy. Yeah. If I have an encrypted file, uh, yes. Excel encryption, I dropped it on there. Oh. How you so, deal with that? Uh, Interesting, did I skip that slide? Um, so we allow you, if you are, unless you're encrypting the data before you upload to our service, it'll work. So if the data is encrypted by us, all data is encrypted actually. So yes, our tags work and all the DLP policies and everything works. But we do give you the ability to bring files that you encrypt yourself and upload them into the service if you want. You can use Azure RMS if you want to client-side encrypt the files, but we encourage you to do that only for a very small subset of super secret data that you want to make sure Microsoft has no access to ever under any circumstances. And for that, since it's a blob that is uploaded to us, we cannot look inside it. 
Yeah, so the second file, you are auditing all this data. That All those audit logs, do they go against my tenant data storage? Uh, no, they do not. Okay, and the last one was the last one of protection tags. The protection tags yeah, and so retention the, so, tags? Yeah, so, so, the, so, the, so the, the retention tags are created interactively. Um, we are, have also provided some guidance about how to, you, sh you can apply them automatically through the application of other metadata that's out there. But right now, it's a, it is, they're created interactively and applied interactively. Hi. Uh, That's it. Let's get over to this one. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So first one is uh, the usage reports. Yes. So there we saw like it shows uh, last six months of uh, reports. Is it possible to go beyond that? Like You can, one? oh, the fact that it shows you 180 days. Mm -hmm. uh, currently it goes back to 180 days. Um, I, we do have, there's a window there, and I'm trying to figure out do we give you the ability to get it or not. You can ask, request it. We keep the data only for some period of time. Again, because even on that, we actually, you might want to have some retention policies around that. So today, there's only, you can only go back six months. Oh, okay. Yourself, yeah. Okay. So the other question I have is uh, that audit log search you showed, is that using enterprise SharePoint search or is that just a query to list or? No, it is actually based on we log every activity as it is happening. It mm -hmm. goes into our log files, and we're searching over those. Oh, so it's, it's searching log files directly, not through Correct. the enterprise search and crawling those data. No. Okay. Uh, the last question I have is, so that deny policy you added for uh, Gmail domain. So Correct. when you add one domain, th does that mean like it's going to allow all other domain? Uh, no, so it's shape? totally up to you. It's an allow list or a deny list. It's a list of domains, and mm -hmm. you can decide to allow a list of domains, or you right. can decide to deny a list of domains. Okay. All right, thanks. For your, for your first question, you want to talk to Zohar, who's sitting right here. He can give you some more data. Okay, thanks. Let's get to here. We're, folks, we're, we're, we're pretty short in time, so we'll take a couple more questions here, and then we'll be around here on the floor we'll to hang take out a few here, questions. So yes. I have one question for you guys. You guys showed us how to create user profiles where we could restrict access to non-corporate devices, where we could restrict um, printing capability, sharing capability. Correct. Right. Is there a capability where you can allow a user to uh, modify or edit a document on their smartphone, even though it's not a corporate device? So yes, actually that policy is, uh, currently that policy does not allow you edit controls, but that's our, we have full intentions to allow you to actually edit. The intent is you can edit without bringing the data down. Correct. So all we want to do is avoid bringing the data down, so edit is in works. It's in it works. It's not available right now. When are you guys expecting that to have Ah, uh, you can't ask me for dates. <laughs> it's in works. It's not coming in by December, but it's in works. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, absolutely. We completely understand that. Yes. And thanks uh, for all the audience help for making that demo work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do is, actually, I think we're out of time. We're going to step outside. We'll be right outside the hall, and you can ask us all the questions. I think the next session, guys, want to come in and get started. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much.